Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today, alongside my co-host, Bob Pastorella, we're going to be chatting with M.R. Carey. Now, M.R. Carey is probably best known for his novel, The Girl With All The Gifts, that was also made into a fantastic film starring the likes of Glenn Close and Gemma Arterton, but there are so many great things that M.R. Carey has done, including his Felix Castor novels and his comic work as Mike Carey with the likes of DC Comics, 2000 AD and Marvel Comics. Such comics as Lucifer and Hellblazer. So whether you are a writer of fiction or a writer of comics or indeed just a reader of either, I think there's a lot that you're going to get from our conversation with M.R. Carey. Now, as always, before we jump into the conversation, a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news. Now you can have a St- Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. Okay, well, with that said, let's not delay. This is M.R. Carey on This Is Horror. And now for a horror interview. Mike, welcome to This Is Horror. Oh, thanks for having me on. I thought to begin with, if we could talk about some of the early life lessons that you learned growing up. Um, Well, I had a a fairly weird upbringing, I think, by modern standards. Um, I've I've talked about this elsewhere. It's kind of a way of life that's uh, that's vanished within my lifetime. I grew up in a, a slum area of Liverpool, and this was you know, in the decades immediately following the Second World War. Uh, I was born in 1959, and Liverpool still bore the marks of that destruction. Uh, Every street had um, gaps in the houses uh, that had been caused by um, houses coming down in bombing raids. And the uh, the debris, the wreckage from those those explosions had never been cleared. So those were those were our playgrounds, um, or rather, those were some of our playgrounds. We also used to play in um, abandoned factories and warehouses, because Liverpool was a city that was in desperate economic decline at that time. A lot of its um, its fortunes had depended on shipping, and now the shipping was going elsewhere. Um, so I grew up against this sort of this backdrop of a city that was falling in on itself losing large swathes of its population, losing its industry, its employment. Um, it was, there was, there was a strange um, freedom to it for us as kids. You know, we had this, this, this vast um, urban jungle to just explore and, and, uh, and make our own. Uh, it was a health and safety nightmare. Some of the things that we used to do were just insane. But it wasn't at all a bad way to, to grow up because of that, that sort of independence, um, because you kind of had to, um, you had kind of had to learn a set of survival skills. I, I don't want to make myself sound, um, like a tough nut because I'm anything but, but, uh, I, I think I, I, I learned to, I learned to sort of rely on my own efforts through that and, uh, not to, not to expect any kind of a, a helping hand from the world. Yeah, and seeing as you said that some of the things you did were insane, with it being a health and safety nightmare, I'd love to go a little bit deeper and hear about those. There's um, there's a scene in one of the Castor novels where um, somebody stands Castor on the parapet of a tall building and flings um, steel offcuts at him uh, for target practice. That was based on a true incident (laughs) that... uh, (laughs) <laughs> where, where, where I was, I was the guy standing on the parapet. Um, there was so there was the metal box factory, and behind the metal box factory, there was the British Oxygen Company. Some friends of mine stole a cylinder of oxygen from the BOC one time, and they set fire to it, 
on the roof of the Timworks, the metal box factory. I was not present for that, right. but the explosion lit up the sky. Um, so it was stuff like that, but also just, you know, just playing in, um, in these abandoned workshops, uh, wandering through sort of three-dimensional mazes that had been abandoned years before. There were just so many death traps, you know, bits of the floor that had been taken out or had fallen out. Um, they were pitch dark because there was no power. Um, it was stuff like that. It's like you grew up in a post-apocalyptic environment. <laughs> it um, it had a lot in common with uh, yeah with post-apocalyptic worlds as they're normally portrayed. Mm -hmm. I, even today, Liverpool is um, you know it, it, it's now got a population of about under 400,000 and in the 60s it was 700,000 so it was um you know it was depopulating and there were all these swathes that uh that were kind of kind of desolate uh kind of semi destroyed falling in on themselves wow that's that's harrowing just to to think about it cuz you know you grow up like in the, in the cities and stuff like that, and you don't you don't really see if you if something gets torn down, it gets you know replaced and or, or, or repaired, and and then have you know that and all the way from World War II, you know, yeah. that's that's a long time, and it and people don't understand that sometimes, you know, a city or town can kind of can kind of die from the inside. That's just it's harrowing. It. it, it it's, I mean, Liverpool hasn't died. In some ways, it's a very vibrant place. And when I go back there, mm -hmm. although it's strange to sort of, um, to visit places that I knew as a child and find how much they've changed, the people, uh, the people in the northwest of England are great. They're sort of really, um, they're really open and welcoming. They're really generous. Um, they've got a great sense of humor. Um, so, although, you know, there were aspects of this, of this, uh, this childhood that, that were, profoundly dysfunctional at the time i i enjoyed it uh it was it was an adventure it was fun and mm -hmm. exciting and even now looking back there aren't that many things that i would want to change um you know we had there, there was deprivation when my dad was out of work sometimes um there wasn't enough food to go around um there was a lot of uncertainty in our lives but there was also, as I said, a lot of a lot of freedom, and to mm -hmm. a kid, a, a kid doesn't sort of um, do the calculus. A kid just just uh, takes for granted that what's around right. is kind of normal. Yeah, do you think growing up in that environment, which Bob has said is obviously akin to a post-apocalyptic scenario, do you think that kind of lent into your interest in genre fiction? Um, I certainly turned on to genre fiction at a very young age. Uh, probably the the in, first of all in the form of um, Enid Blyton's novels, with mm. the Magic Wishing Chair, the Far Away Tree, those fantasies, and of course the the comics, the sort of um, comics like the Wham, Pow, Beezer, Buster, Topper. Uh, the UK used to have this great tradition of humor comics for younger children which had a lot of surrealism and fantasy in them um, and some of the people who were working on those books were you know were geniuses were masters of their craft people like leo baxendale ken reed so i got hooked on that stuff and then through that uh, i discovered american comics the stanley jack kirby fantastic four was an early favorite um, horror relatively late i didn't come come into come to start reading horror until my teens um, Maybe even a bit later, but I, th I think um, I think I was always partly somewhere else. I I, I I don't think that genre fictions are inherently escapist. I'm not trying to suggest that, but I I, I was a, a sort of dreamy space 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 out spaced out kind of kid, um, most of the time living inside my own head. Um, books and comics were. My, 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 my staple entertainments. They were what I, when I wasn't doing schoolwork uh, or, or playing out in those abandoned factories, I would be reading. Uh, and I was completely uh, voracious when it, when it came to reading. We didn't buy books. Books were a, 
were kind of a luxury. So, so we went to the library. There were two local libraries about a mile from my house in either direction. And I would have um, four books on the go from each of those libraries, which is the maximum number of tickets you could hold. Yeah, and I mean, were you also telling stories at that age? I mean, you said you were spaced out and always dreaming about things, but did you write stories down or did you tell stories to your friends or did that come a little bit later? From from a fairly early age, I used to steal exercise books from my school and write um, write stories in them. And I've still got a stack of those that yeah. I kept, kept through all these years. Um, I guess I would have started doing that when I was about 13 or 14. And at that time, um, my, big, my big sort of um, addiction uh, when it came to fictions was uh, Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champion novels. You know, Elric, Hawkmoon, Coram, um, Ericose. Uh, I was reading all that stuff. And I thought the only way to tell uh, a fantasy story was to make it be a quest for a magical artifact. So I wrote, I wrote tons of, um, of novels. Uh, I'm going to put air quotes around that word, but what I thought of as novels that were just basically variations on that story, the quest for the magic sword, the magic axe, the magic ocelot, you know, whatever it happened to be. Um, and then at a certain point I discovered uh, Mervyn Peake, the Gorman Gas trilogy, which is a kind of um, a kind of gothic horror fantasy, beautifully written, and I started doing my own pastiches of that. Nobody, ever, nobody ever got to see these things. I never right, actually, right, never yeah. showed them to anyone. Mm. They were yeah. just my own benefit, really. Well, I was going to say it just reminds me. I still need to read the Gorman Gas trilogy. Right. <laughs> it's it's one of those that I just don't feel like that it's going to be worthy to read on the on the on a kindle i need the books you know <laughs> it, it is definitely worth reading it in the book because um peak did his own illustrations for it he was an artist as well as a mm -hmm. as well as a writer but he was an artist first and foremost um and his his versions of the characters are beautifully observed and i think that it really adds something to have those pictures in front of you when you're reading that's you know, you're not the first one to tell me that. It's just a matter of me just getting them and you know pulling the trigger, as they say. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I could kick myself because my my local big chain used bookstore had a box set, and I, I believe it had the you know the original drawings and everything and it was like for five dollars and i you know i had it in my hand <laughs> you know and I, and I put it down i go i'll get it next time you know and of course yeah. you know what that means next time you know i'm, I'm asking them to do y'all have it you know and they're like going no apparently we sold it and i'm like oh man it was only five bucks i should have bought it <laughs> Some, somebody you know? somebody told me there's um a tv version that's being developed at the moment which has neil gaiman uh doing the the writing that that should oh, be worth wow. uh, worth a look i would think uh, yeah that's that's first part of that that's that's that sounds very cool very cool oh yeah and so when did you decide to write vocationally i know that before you were writing comics or at least before you were writing them professionally you were teaching for a number of years so i wonder what was the impetus to move from teaching to comics it, it it's it, so I, I i kind of i never stopped writing though so those um those stories that i did as a teenager in the, in the little school notebooks um i carried on doing that i carried on writing um as a as a as a hobbyist throughout throughout my teens and into my 20s um and as a teacher i was still writing um i was writing novels or um again you know sort of so-called novels big shapeless bags of story because I, I never really gave any serious thought to structure and occasionally i'd actually from my sort of mid-20s onwards i would send some of these things up to publishers and they would always get rejected because they were unpublishable. Um, they were just sprawling messes, really. Uh, the rejection letters would often say, you should try writing this as a novel. Um, and then at a certain point, 
I started to write uh, criticism and reviews for um, fanzines for amateur uh, comics magazines. There was one called The Fantasy Advertiser that was edited by Martin Skidmore. And I did a ton of reviews for that. And then through that, I started pitching ideas for actual comics. Uh, Martin Skidmore became the editor of a, a very short-lived um, publishing house called uh, Apocalypse Press. And I, I pitched a whole ton, a whole bunch of ideas to those guys. Um, I had two of them accepted, a horror story called Legions of Hell and a superhero uh, comic called Aquarius. But they, they, the company went bankrupt, ha having sort of commissioned the work from me. They went bankrupt before they published any of it, um, which became a sort of hallmark of my early career. What, what Jonah did to shipping, I did to a lot of small comics companies. If you hired me, it was a sure sign that you were going to go out of business in the next couple of years. Um, but eventually, through that, through doing that, I started to meet people who were doing indie comics in the US. Um, I did some work from Malibu just before they ceased trading. Um, I did some work for Calibre Comics. And um, over the course of about 10 years, built up um, some contacts and sort of got a got a, a kind of kind of a handle on how the industry worked and also got better at, at scripting um and i started sending samples of my work to dc to dc vertigo who at that time were publishing um the sandman your game is the sandman that was my favorite comic book so i, I targeted the editors on that book and that was how i broke into eventually broke into comics i got a, a letter back from elisa quitney who was the editor on sandman um, for the end of its run and she invited me to pitch and through that I got to do the Lucifer miniseries and then the Lucifer monthly book um, so I, I was an overnight success in 10 years yeah yeah as are many overnight mm -hmm. successes it's like wow they did it so quickly it only took them a decade or two <laughs> to manage it <laughs> but it always it always looks effortless from outside. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 were, there were times when I thought, you know, I should give this up because I'm getting nowhere. And it, it wasn't like writing was easy around the edges of a teaching career because teaching is kind of all consuming. Um, so it was hard to do. And I got discouraged, um, gave up, then tried again, gave up, then tried again. But looking back on it now, you know, none of that time was wasted. Um, you kind of have to pay your dues because you have to, you have to put in the uh, the ten thousand hours or whatever it is. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's right. And with those early comics for Malibu, they had quite a heavy metal theme because you had one on Ozzy Osbourne, the comeback, and yep. one on Pantera, Power Dear in God. the Darkness. <laughs> so yeah. t talk us through those. I mean, are, are you a heavy metal fan or were By you? No means. By no means. I, I, I listen to folk music mostly. Right, um, right. <laughs> so um, I met this this uh, this woman, Lorene Haynes. Uh, she was married to the comic artist Dave Dorman. And Lorene and Dave together wanted to set up a, a comics agency, you know, an agency for comic book creators called Big Time. Um, and they never actually got around to doing it. But Lorene said to me, at this time I had like maybe 17 pages of published work certainly no more than that she said look I'll, I'll shop your stuff around here in the states i'll see if i can find anybody who uh, who needs a writer on a project and she she went to malibu and um they said well um yeah we're going to do this ozzy osbourne comic does your man know anything about ozzy osbourne and lorene said he is ozzy osbourne's biggest fan <laughs> He lives and breathes yeah. Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah. And then she, so she called me up and said, you better listen to some Ozzy Osbourne, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that, that was how it happened. And the, the Ozzy book was fine. Ozzy's people were really helpful. They, they, they put me in touch with a guy who had like a um, like hundred scrapbooks of, uh, of press cuttings. They, they gave me access to all of this stuff that made the book, you know, sort of a piece of cake to write. The Pantera book was different. Um, the lead singer of Pantera, Phil Anselmo, is that his name? That's the one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, so he, he wanted to write the comic himself and he'd come up with an idea for the comic. And, the, and they sent me this. They sent me this four page pitch that he'd sent in. And it was basically evil vampires kidnap the rock band Pantera 
and they, they torture them. They tear out our fingernails. They put lighted matches in our eardrums. Uh, they, they do this, do that, they do that. Three and a half pages of this pitch was just the tortures <laughs> that Pantera were being subjected to. And then at the end, um, we break free and, and we kill the vampires and then we do a concert. So <laughs> my brief was to turn that into a story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I, I tried dutifully to listen to Pantera's stuff and it really wasn't my cup of tea at all. Um, but I, I, I did my best with that book. I, 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 I'm not proud of it at all. Um, fortunately, nobody bought it. I think there was a print run of 5,000 and I think 4,997 of them are still in a warehouse somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so the three were actually uh, three of the members of Pantera then. Obviously, <laughs> one of them decided not to buy it. <laughs> yeah, um, so there was that. But it was, I mean, it was, it was a weird gig. Uh, but it was a way of getting getting your work published, and you know the 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 Aussie book in particular had painted art by Tom Cuffin. It was gorgeous, um, and all of that stuff I was sending up to um, you know to other editors and saying, "Give me a job, give me a job." So it was all it was all worthwhile, I think, however strange it was. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I guess the Lucifer work that you did was the big breakthrough then is it, would you say that's about right well around about that time i met karen berger uh, in london there used to be a thing called uh, the uk comic arts convention in london this is going back to like late 70s early 80s um and there was be just before the uk comic arts convention there was always like a, a professionals uh pre-con that was run by the SSI, the Society for Strip Illustrators. And I met, I met Karen because she'd come along to one of those, um, those pre-con sessions. And I got talking to her and I, I said, I made some joking comment along the lines of, you know, I was still looking for the big break. And she, she, she said, there's no such thing as a big break. What there is is a long, long sequence of little breaks. And if you're lucky, they get bigger. Um, and that, that's certainly how it was for me. So the, getting the Lucifer gig was was very, very important. But before that, getting to write um, uh, Dr. Faustus and Inferno for Caliber was really important because Caliber had great production values. They didn't pay, but they had wonderful production values. They did these gorgeous black and white books. Um, my Dr. Faustus was drawn by Mike Perkins. Um, who's since gone on to do, you know, Captain America and, and Green Lantern and The Stand and a ton of wonderful stuff. Um, so they were, they were really, really good calling cards. I wouldn't have got Lucifer um, if I hadn't been doing that work. And then the Lucifer miniseries, although it was, um, you know, it was, it was a hugely important, you know, a hugely big deal for me, um, the door shut in my face almost immediately because Elisa Quitney, who was the editor on that, went away on maternity leave. And she was the only editor I knew at DC. So, you know, there was no one else I could pitch to. There was no one else who knew me or, or cared about me. So I took the chance that summer and I went out to San Diego. I stopped off in the DC offices. Um, and then I went to the San Diego Comic-Con for the first time and introduced myself to Shelley Bond, <clears throat> who became my editor on, on the Lucifer Monthly and on... Um, the uh, read gifters and on my faith in Frankie and on, um, you know, most of my vertigo work at that time, I just like introduced myself to her at the DC booth and she didn't know me from Adam and she didn't have time really to sort of babysit some snot nosed Brit, uh, who didn't know his ass from his elbow. So she actually said to me, um, and I'm quoting verbatim, um, I'll go, I'll buy you a coffee or a hot dog. And you've got 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I went, I went for the hot dog. So obviously I went for the coffee because you, you can talk around a cup of coffee mm. more than around a hot dog. Um, and I pitched a, a couple of things to her. Cole pitched a couple of things. And in each case, she said, nope, nope. Already got something like that. And I thought, okay, so the best way to play this game, the best way to win this game is not to play it. So I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I've got nothing else to pitch at the moment. And, and I went home and then I worked up a pitch over a couple of weeks and sent it into her. Um, and that became the Lucifer Monthly uh, in, in due course. But um, it was it, it was always one step forward and then two or three or four steps back. Yeah. 
And I mean, how long did it take you to feel that, okay, you're certainly progressing forward now, you're comfortable in being a professional writer? Because, I mean, I think however far you get, certainly from the people we've spoken with, there's always that little bit of self-doubt and imposter syndrome can creep in. It's just that the goalposts are changing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, I don't, I don't think imposter, imposter syndrome is even a bad thing. Um, I mean, in, in answer to your question, I think it was long after I gave up teaching. It was long after I started writing full time that I sort of took the liberty of, of thinking of myself as a writer rather than as a teacher who was taking a sabbatical to try out writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you, you, you always have that self-doubt and the self-doubt can be a friend because it, it keeps you from, it keeps you from believing your own bullshit. You know, it keeps, it keeps you from, um, from making assumptions about your abilities. I, I, I think it, um, it helps to be tentative when you come onto something new. It helps to sort of explore it with a certain amount of, um, Humility, caution, I don't know what to call it. Um, I would hate to get to a stage where because I thought I knew all the answers, I didn't look for any new questions. You know, I didn't try to do things in a different way. Mm. Um, I, th I think every time you write a story in whatever medium and, you're, if you, and it starts to come together, you're solving the problem of that story. It's specific to that story, and you always start again from scratch the next time. That's certainly the way it is for me. Right, yeah. I think it might have been Neil Gaiman who said that you never really learn how to write a novel just to write the one that you are working on at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that's, that's kind, of, it's kind of terrifying and it's kind of glorious. Because it means that um, each each time you do it, each each iteration um, is a is a new it's a discovery for you, um, which means you know hopefully if you're doing it right, it's also a discovery for the readers. And I think it's possible. I think it's possible to get into a situation where you're telling the same story again and again. Um, and I, I I know writers that this has happened to because you know because they've had a spectacular success with one thing it's become almost impossible for them to do something different. Um, I mean, your publisher is not going to um, mind a bit if you just tell the same story again and again, because that makes you into a brand. It makes you very, very easily marketable. But I think it's kind of, um, it's kind of stultifying and self-destructive in the end. Right. Yeah. And I guess it can be creatively frustrating as well. And if we look at the novels that you've written, even though there might be some thematic commonalities, if you look at something like Someone Like Me and The Girl With All The Gifts, they're clearly very, very different beasts indeed. Well, I, I think there have been like phases um, that I've gone through in my work. I mean, the, 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 the cast of novels are all of a piece mm -hmm. and, and they, they, they work in the same way. And I did that. Um, I did that five times. I was I was really loving it. I, I, I loved writing Castro as a character. I loved using that sort of hard boiled noir voice. Um, but then I started experimenting. I started doing different things. Um, and go with all the gifts. You know, in terms in terms of voice and in terms of um, structure, I think it's very different from the Castro novels. Um, which is probably why my publisher decided to give me a new pseudonym for it. You know, it's, it's an M.R. Carey book rather than a Mike Carey book. Mm. Um, of, of all the things I've written, Girl With All The Gifts is still far and away the most successful, the most commercially successful. Um, there was a time when it, it had outsold all of my other novels collectively. Um, I think that might still be true, actually. And that, that meant that um, my publishers started to take a orbit started to take a much closer look at these the projects that i was pitching because they had a stronger sense of what people would expect from mr carey or what they wanted um mr carey to be associated with um it's it's a it's a strange situation i think that the, uh, there is a sense in which um it's it's easier 
to redo the last thing you did than it is to do something different. But it's better for you if you're doing something different. Um, I, I guess I've been lucky because I've, I've worked in a lot of different media. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, every, every medium that you write in is a different toolkit. It's a, a, different, a different method of telling stories. And I think moving between different media helps to keep you fresh, helps to sort of keep you from, um, from, from sort of getting into a, into a rut. Mm. Yeah, and speaking of which, I wonder what are some of the different lessons that are transferable from writing books and screenplays and comics? And what are some of the things that you think are uniquely their own for each of those mediums? Um. I was on a panel with Chris Golden at, at San Diego way back in so it's like 2008, 2009. And he said, um, and I think this is true, which is why it stayed with me, that every creative medium has one thing that it does better than any other medium. One thing that is kind of like it's, um, it's, it's superpower. It's, it's uh, um, something that's written into its DNA. So novels, novels are brilliant for giving you the interior, interior life of characters. Movies create worlds in a way that's immersive. Comics have parallel verbal and visual narratives that can either work against each other or work in concert with each other. Um, when I started writing novels, I did not have to know how to structure a story. Writing for comics forced me to learn about structure forced me to think about structure because a comic book, if you're writing a monthly book for an for the American market, you have 22 pages or 20 pages or 18 pages, whatever your publishers have given you. And that is a, you know, it's a, a fixed canvas, a small canvas and a canvas of a fixed size. And you've got to do your storytelling within that space. And if you run out of pages before you run out of story, then tough, no one's going to lend you uh, any extra real estate. So you you start to plan. You start to plan the scenes. You start to plan the transitions. You start to think in terms of how many pages does this need? How do I get from this scene to that scene in in the most economical way? Um, it 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 sort of brings you brings you um, up against those decisions in a way that writing prose doesn't, because prose, yeah, you know, a novel is a big sprawly canvas uh, that 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 morphs to any size and shape you want. So writing for comics was uh, going to school for me. I, mean, I love comics for, for their own sake, but also it was a great way to figure out some of the things about storytelling that I'd been bad at up to that point. Um, com coming back from comics to writing prose fiction, um, I was better able to use the freedoms of prose fiction. Um, I mean, you almost get drunk on the power. Uh, you, you, you've got this book that you're writing for six months or nine months and within that time you you can get to chapter 20 and suddenly decide i should have put the revolver in the door in chapter four or i should have uh, introduced this character in in an, in, a, in an opening scene and you can go back and you can do it um you can be writing all the different um phases all the different sections of the novel at the same time whereas with a comic you send a, send an issue in it gets approved it goes to the penciler and bang you you can't do anything to change it after that so I, I guess um, the, the, the storytelling skills I learned from comics were all transferable, but actually within the context of novel writing, I could do different things with them, which was great. Um, going from that to screenwriting was a death trap. Going from comics to screenwriting is, is, um, is fraught with danger because a movie screenplay or a TV screen, screenplay looks superficially like a comic script, but actually works very, very differently from a comic script. Um, if you're writing a comic, you kind of are the director and the cinematographer as well as the, um, as well as the writer. You know, you're in control of pacing, you're in control of camera angles, you're in control of um, page turns and structure in a, in a, in a sort of very, uh, very intimate uh, and yet universal way. Whereas with a screenplay, what you're doing is writing a kind of blueprint for a story that works for lots and lots of different groups of people. You know, the actors are going to have the, the, the screenplay in front of them when they're, when they're doing their part, but the director's going to have it, the, the director of photography is going to have it. It's also a selling document that will be 
shown to production companies to get money on board for the project and so on. So it, it has to work in a in a much more in a much more freewheeling way. There are, there are specifics you can get into in a comic script that you can't in a screenplay. And initially, I just wrote comic scripts and pretended they were screenplays. Just added in words like interior right. um, workshop mm-hmm. day and thought, well, I'll do it. Um, and it took me a long time to unlearn those lessons and, and figure out that screenplays worked, you know, did different things. Yeah, it seems like in comics that you got a little bit more leeway with like interior thought not much but whereas in a script um that would probably be something that you would have to show because it's what you can see and what you can hear yeah you know and that's to me that would probably be probably one of the biggest you know problematic areas is like how how do i portray that and and how do you sort of um train yourself not to ever refer to interiority because right. it, because, in, because in a screenplay you're only describing um, what's visible and what's audible, and you're describing it in a kind of measured way. Also, you know, you're 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 kind of responsible for the story on a moment by moment basis, um, in a way that you're not. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the the, the I, I, I don't know if I can put it better than that. Um, yeah, you're, you're describing the beats as they come, whereas in a comic, um, you can you can kind of compress time or elongate time in ways that you can't in a screenplay. Right. And then that makes sense too, because I mean, in, in when you're reading a comic, I mean, it's, you would think initially I used to think that, you know, Hey, they just, you know, they put this together and somebody drew some art and made it all work. But there's some, there's a, there's definitely a, a, a placement, you know, that you know when you turn you you want to have when you turn the page you want you want to keep them turning the pages so there's a there's a there's a pace there yeah that's that's probably quite different than a script and, and whereas a script whereas a, a, a tv program or a movie you're you're kind of you're kind of moving through uh, time um, so that you're, you're you're always in a present moment in a comic book, if you have a uh, have the comic open in front of you and you're reading one panel, you can see the panels before it and you can see the panels after it. So time is translated into space. Right. Um, and then you get to a, um, a splash page or a double page spread and suddenly you're, you're cut loose from those past, those, those past and futures and you're just sort of like glorying in this, in this sudden, um, sudden, sudden timeless immensity. Um, being being able to use techniques like that, I, I I think I think there's a there's a comics literacy, and I think if you don't read comics um, for pleasure, I think it's very very difficult to write them effectively, and that's probably true for any mm. creative medium. You have to be a fan first and foremost, mm-hmm. um, or you or you can't you you kind of you're kind of not in the conversation. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think. It was Stephen King and indeed many other people who have said if you want to be a good writer, first and foremost, you've got to be a good reader. You've got yeah, to read right. widely too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, 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 you have to read and you have to, I, th- I think it's a mechanical skill. So you have to read like crazy and then you have to write like crazy. You get better at, better at it by doing it. Yeah. Um, as with any sort of mechanical thing like riding a bike. Um, and then the other thing you need is opinions. You need, you need to show what you've written to other people, especially people mm. who don't like you, uh, people who don't have any sort of uh, vested interest in making you happy. Right. If you, if you show your writing to your mum, she's <laughs> always going to say it's genius. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't know why some people might think that you could write something or write in a medium that you're not a fan of because it's almost something that's unique to writing i mean you don't see people who discover an instrument that they've never heard played and think oh i could give that a go i mean how yeah. could you without having known what the <laughs> mechanics are to even begin with back, back when i was teaching i had a student um i will, I will not say his name but I, I i i've never forgotten this guy because um he was in my a-level class and in the first lesson, I just asked people to say, you know, what are you reading at the moment? What are you reading for pleasure at the moment? 
And this kid said, uh, well, nothing. I said, well, what was the last thing you read for pleasure? Nothing. It turned out he'd only ever read four books in his life, and they were the four books that he'd done for English Literature GCSE. And now, because he was doing English Literature A-level, he intended to increase his lifetime score from four to 13, because there were nine, there were nine set texts on the A-level. And I kind of you know, gently said to him, you, you might want to think of doing a different A-level, because really that's... That's not how it works. You know, you, you, you've, you've read all this other stuff. The, the, idea, the idea is you've read all this other stuff in background and you bring those insights to bear on the text that you, that you read for the course. Yeah, that's remarkable. The only thing that's impressive <laughs> about that is that he passed the GCSE to be able yep. to do the A-level <laughs> class after only having read the four books that were on the syllabus. So some, someone, uh, someone I met at a convention recently said they were going to write a novel. And I said, oh, great. Yeah, that, that, that's really cool. Um, I think everyone's got a story in, in, in them. And she said the, the next thing she said to me was, can you tell me what sort of what app to use? Is there a good free app? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that's a very... That's all it takes is just an app. That's, yeah, that's very, it. very modern response, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't tell no one what that app is. No, yeah. no, yeah, we keep the app to ourselves. It's yeah, part of, you have to be part of the club, which how, requires reading. Yeah. <laughs> how did you even react to that? I mean, what what do you say to someone when they give that as a question? I, I told her about. So I said, you know, you need a good word processor. Microsoft Office is the industry standard, but there's the Sun Open Office, which is free, and there are some tutorials online if you look for them. Yeah, that was a pretty. I left, it, I left yeah. it there. Yeah, pretty useful <laughs> response then. It's like you can even do things like there's a note paper, and you can buy a pen, and that, that app will yes. work well too. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get you some of the way there. Yeah. Well, we were talking about the different mediums that you've written in, and I wonder how did you go about adapting The Girl with All the Gifts from book to screen? Um, so the weird thing about that was that um, I kind of wasn't adapting it from book to screen. I was working on the novel and the screenplay simultaneously. I'd written a short story called Iphigenia in Aulis for um, uh, an American anthology edited by uh, Charlene Harris and Tony Kellner, an apple for the creature. And the brief for that was to do um, a horror story or a dark fantasy story with a theme of school days. Um, and I wrote the story and it had Melanie in it. It had this, this um, little girl who is a, a monster but doesn't know that she's a monster. And uh, having, having written it, I kind of couldn't put the character down. I thought there's something really interesting about that character and there's something interesting about the voice in which um, she speaks to us. Um, so I, I kept on pitching it at anyone who would stand still long enough for me to do it. Uh, I pitched it to Orbit, uh, to my, edit my, my then editor, Anne Clark. And I, I also pitched it to uh, an independent producer I was working with at the time, Camille Gattin. Um, and we were working, the, Camille and I were working on a... Um, a movie screenplay based on somebody else's novel, based on a novel that she had the rights to. And in the middle of the of that project, the rights were sold away to someone else. Uh, she came to the end of her option, she offered to renew, and the guy said no and sold the rights elsewhere. So we kind of, yeah, we were in the middle of the stream and our horse died under us. Um, and Cammy turned to me and said, well, what else could we do? And I showed her um, this, this short story, Virginia, and I said, I, I'd love to do, I'd love to work this up into something bigger. So I was, I was writing the novel and I was writing draft of the screenplay um, at exactly the same time. I was kind of living in that story space and finding different ways of navigating it, different ways of, um, of approaching the story, which was wonderful. That, that, I think that's when I, I, I started to figure out how screenplays were meant to work. And I think Girl With All The Gifts was probably the first screenplay I wrote that was fit for purpose. Right. And what a wonderful cast to land for your first screenplay as well. I couldn't believe it. Uh, when Cammy said that she'd sent the um, the draft to Glenn Close, um, mm. I, I yeah, I, I, I thought I'm going to wake up at some point here. It was the first the first day's rushes that I saw, were the scene where um, where 
Glenn Close's character Caldwell is walking down the corridor at the base mm. and see and sees Melanie looking out through the little Judas window. Yeah, yeah. In her cell door. And she she sort of turns around realizing that Melanie's eyes are on her and she turns and looks straight into the camera. So that was the first shot from the film that, that I ever saw and the hairs on the back of my <laughs> neck just stood up. It was a wonderful moment. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I'd imagine seeing your book then on the screen, there's always going to be a little bit of nerves. I mean, even when you've written the script and you've had that control, because so much is down to the actors and the director and the cinematography. But I mean, it really is a very beautifully shot and put together film so i i imagine you must have just been so happy with the final product i was ecstatic um but i'd, I'd, I'd sort of been involved at every stage i finished writing in um i guess march or april of 2015 and i'd been writing while um Cammy had been sort of getting money on board for it. And very often when we went to um, a production company or a distributor and pitched it, it would be the three of us. It would be me, Cammy, who was the lead producer, and Colin McCarthy, who was the director. And we had this, you know, this routine, this act that we worked up between the three of us where one of us would talk and then the other would, another would chip in. And we, we sort of re refined it over um, between a dozen and 20 different meetings and then um when they got the money for the film we did the tech recce's together um so i was there for all of the the location scouting um i was on set for a lot of the shooting um i was watching some of the editing so i i, I kind of and and, and and i was also in the film uh, i get a little tiny cameo in the film um, and one of the zombies who gets his brains blown out uh, uh, when, when, the, when the fences are falling at the, at the base. So I, I, I felt like there was never a stage when I was cut out of the loop. Normally, I think when the writers handed in the final draft, the last thing you want is to have him or her be on set because at the, at the best, they're a distraction. And at the worst, they can be a total pain in the ass. But Colin was always uh, incredibly generous and found sort of reasons for me to be there. Um, they got me to write the headlines on the newspapers in the scene where you know, the, the scene in the uh, in the convenience store where Gallagher dies. Mm. Um, so I, I sort of ran up some fake newspapers for them, which which you can't even see because of the lighting in the scene. Right. So it was just uh, you know make, making me feel like I had a, I still had some reason to be on set, whereas really I was just there. Um, glorying in everything that was happening. It was, it was just wonderful to watch. I, I, I can sort of vividly remember when they shot that, um, that final sequence of the base, the base uh, falling to the zombies, you know, the, the hungry sort of pouring in and devouring everything in their path. Um, I was one of the hungry. So I was, you know, the, the, the um, second AD would say, you know, go, go from that fence there, run, run all the way to the jeep. When you get to the jeep, um, veer off to the left and run to that hangar. And then you'll probably meet some other zombies that are running in the opposite direction. Just turn around and be part of that group and run run back. And it looked like chaos. It looked like nothing at all. And then you go behind the um, you go to a video village where they're looking at the, um, the, the live camera feeds. And suddenly you realize it all makes sense. It, it, it's, all, it's all been choreographed and it all makes sense. And it looks fantastic to the camera. Yeah, well, it was. It was just yeah. It was just an amazing experience to be part of that. Yeah, and I'm gonna have to rewatch it to see your cameo as well. Because I, <laughs> I, I guess because I didn't know you had a cameo, I wasn't looking out for it. But yeah, that's very reminiscent of the kind of thing Stephen King would do. Just be some <laughs> dude in the background. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm the second. I'm the second zombie that gets shot in the head at the fence. Right, um, and and if if you if you freeze frame on it because I'm only on screen for like a second, but all of the zombies around me are my friends and family. Oh, nice. uh, oh wow! <laughs> because we um, so the second AD Pebbles, who was responsible for um for creating the zombie horde, he said, you know, just ask ask anybody you know if they want to be extras because we're going to need a ton of extras. And I went around asking lots of people, would you like to be a zombie in a movie? Nobody said no. 
It turns out that everybody has a secret yen to eat brains. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question from Patreon regarding the girl with all the gifts, and this is from Ryan Whitley, and he says, what was the first germ of an idea you had for the girl with all the gifts, and how did you spin that into the terrible, beautiful vision of captive children that followed? Oh, th 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 thank you for that, uh, for, for, for the, uh, the, the implied compliment. Um, so the, 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 I'd agreed to do this story for um, an apple for the creature, and the brief was, horror or dark fantasy with a theme of school days. Um, and having agreed to it, I spent a long time just staring at the wall. I couldn't think of anything that wasn't a bad riff on, on the Harry Potter story. And then I just woke up one day with the image in my head of a little girl in a classroom writing an essay. And the essay she's writing is the one that, that you're made to write like at least three or four times in the course of your school career, which is what I want to be when I grow up. And we can see, but she can't, that growing up is not going to be an option for her because she's already, you know, she's a zombie. She's one of the undead. She's not going to be allowed to grow up. Um, so that, that was, that was the sort of, the little, the little sort of uh, inkling that was in my mind. And I started to write it. Um, quite early on, I realized that um, getting inside Melanie's head, presenting the story from Melanie's perspective, which is a very naive perspective, was going to be really important. We need not to know the things that she doesn't know. So you have to sort of al align the reader with her. And I turned it into narrative present. I wrote in very, very short declarative sentences. Um, so I was aiming for the story to sound like a 10-year-old girl um, telling you the story you know like sort of like enthusiastically all, all, all of the all of the sort of the the, the the facts pouring out one after another because for a child um experience the, the, the world presents itself um with an incredible intensity and an incredible sort of um presence that you lose as you grow older you know any any tiny thing can fill a child's world from horizon to horizon um it's it's when you get older that you start to get lost in memories and anticipations and the present moment loses its vividness. So I wanted to tell the story with that vividness, which is why I, I use the, the slightly weird style that it's, that it's told in. Um, and getting the voice right made a lot of other things come right. And I guess in a way this question from Tracy Kenworth is somewhat related because she wants to know a little bit about your process as a writer. So I'm not sure if she's talking about a daily writer's routine or if she's talking about that initial germ of an idea to the finished product. But how, I mean, how you, how you work it up, how you sort of um, plan and process. Right. Um, well, the, 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 the first part of that, my day, my day is a scattershot. I, w I work long hours, but I'm easily distracted. So I don't work intensively for long periods of time. I do short bursts and then I'll play a game of Sonic the Hedgehog because I like retro gaming or, um, or Flicky's Island or uh, some, some silly, silly Sega game from the 1980s make a cup of tea, stare out of the window, come back and do another, another burst and so on. So I'll start early and finish late, but I'm not working like a maniac all that time. Um, th apparently there's an experiment you can do, rather a cruel experiment, with flies and bees. If you put um, bees in a bottle and, and you put point the bottom, you know, the, the closed end of the bottle towards a window and leave the neck of the bottle open, the bees will all die because they'll all fly towards the light because they're, they're, they're sensible and, and uh, disciplined enough to fly towards the light, and therefore they're flying towards the closed end of the bottle, and they don't discover the open end. If you put flies in a bottle and do the same thing, they'll all escape, because they fly in any direction they like. They just ricochet around. I'm a fly, not a bee. I ricochet. Mm -hmm. I don't have any sense of direction, um, which is bad, because it means that uh, I, I don't write efficiently, or work efficiently, but it's good, because I sort of happen on things, um, and sometimes the things are really good. Um, so no structure to my daily, uh, work, working life at all. 
Um, in terms of process, in terms of how I get from the, the first idea to the end point, I, I do it in a sort of massively long-winded way. When I was working on Lucifer, I got used to writing really detailed plans because Shelley Bond was the kind of editor who liked to see the plan and liked to argue with the plan. You know, she'd see what you had in mind and she'd interrogate it in a really sort of robust and useful way. She'd make you justify the decisions you were making. And I haven't gotten into that habit. I've never really gotten out of it. So I do really um, long-winded and detailed plans. Having done them, though, I often ignore them. I think the beauty of a, a fully worked out plan is that it's there when you need it. But when the better idea comes, which very often it will, you can abandon the plan, go off piste, explore the new idea while knowing that the plan is still there to fall back on if you need it. Um, I do a thing. I can't justify this. I don't know why it works for me, but it does. I have a, a like a big notebook, which is a page a day diary. So a, like a, an A4 notebook with 365 pages. And when I'm planning a story, I will do it in the form of a catechism. I'll ask myself the question on the page and then I'll answer the question. So why does he do this? What's his motivation? Well, he's trying to get revenge for such and such. OK, but wouldn't it be easier for him to do this? And I'll have that 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 sort of strange two way conversation with myself for page after page after page of rambling notes. And somehow in doing that, um, the story starts to get a clearer focus for me. Yeah, I found I actually found that little technique from uh, David Morrell reading his uh his book on writing and it's cause that's something very similar to what he does. And it's basically just, you know, continuously asking yourself questions about, you know, and it can start off with why do you want to write the story? Right. You know, and he, and so, and I, I and mean, I've tried it, uh, you know, several times with different stories and, uh, it really kind of helps because you, you, un, you know, you, you uncover motivations and, you can shift those to characters and things like that. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's just something, you know, is, is it writing? Yes, it's writing. You may not actually be writing the story, but you know, you, you're getting that foundation set. Yeah. You're, you're, you're sort of walking over the territory um, and, and, th and thinking about it and sort of anticipating the, um, the, the, the flaws, the, the holes that you might fall into. And, and I need to do that longhand. I can't do that on a computer. Um, I'll write my first draft on the computer, but all of the planning work is is scribbled because it just feels like it's better if it's analog. But going going to the computer feels like an irre irrevocable step. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to write notes on a computer. It really yeah. is because you, you, you immediately go to like this, you know, the formal outline thing, you know, where you have Roman numeral one. And then A, you know, and then yes. one, two, three, you know, and it's like, that's just how we're taught. And, you know, I'm, I'm like you, I initially, you know, I have to, you know, put, get a notebook. And, and so there's, there's a lot of pages with scribble scratches on them that, you know, later you, it's like, what is that word? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, and I've got, um, I've got years worth of those notebooks kicking around, you know, because, because it's a very, very um, long winded process. It's hundreds oh. and hundreds of pages sometimes. And, and uh, you know, you, 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 you refer to them when you need to, and then you never go back to them again. So the books just pile up there. Mm -hmm. um, no use to any man or beast. <laughs> but, 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 but they're vital at the, at the stage when, 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 they're, when, they're, when I use them. They're absolutely vital. I can't just go straight to, uh, straight to typing. Right. Yeah, there's something very different about the mindset and the mode when you're writing on the computer or you're writing on paper. And I wonder if the paper is better for those initial ideas because with a computer, you can easily delete things. It feels almost too much like a finished product, but on the paper, it's almost an unruly stream of consciousness it's more meditative it feels in a way like there's less judgment you can just write whatever you want you can let it come out it's yeah oh, almost hypnotic even though that sounds slightly pretentious to put it like that 
it's the it's the unruliness and the sort of the directionlessness that's valuable i think mm. the fact that you are wandering uh at will over a space yeah um and you know you you um you 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 find out which paths work by treading them uh, and then to like Re, uh, untreading them if they if they don't work, the de- the dead ends are valuable too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I and mean, the, the the um the other thing I've started to do more and more is write um write sample passages to try and get a voice, try and get a sense of voice. Um, because I think st- style, style and substance are 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 intermingled. Yeah, you know, I think that there there's a sense in which um the medium is the message and the style is the is the story. And so playing with styles, playing with ways into the story can be a, can be another way of bringing the story clear in your head. Mm, yeah. Well, I know that we're coming up to the time that we have together, but I wanted to ask a little bit about someone like me, and I'd love to talk about those issues of identity and self. And I love how in reading this, Definitely for me, I started to think about more philosophical issues and if there's a part of our personality that has lain dormant for years, but then it comes to the surface, is it still us? Are there possibly two selves within one body? And I mean, I've always been fascinated and terrified by issues of mental health and having your own mind play tricks on you to have that unreliable mind. Mm. I, I, I used to teach, I mean, yeah, the, 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 those themes are sort of very much at the heart of the book. But, but back when I was teaching, I used to teach uh, communication studies uh, at A-level. And a big part of that is social psychology. And um, so I was aware of experiments like the, um, the, the, uh, the onlooker, experiments where you get uh, you get your subjects to witness a small crime like shoplifting mm. um which has been staged and then basically you you monitor their response to this uh this event and responses vary according to what other people around you do if there if you're alone um you might behave one way if there are other people in the room when the thing happens and they do not report it you are less likely to report it um you're more likely to be to be swayed by um the situation personality is a lot of personality is situational uh the standard prison experiment although it's uh, notorious and and uh the methods were questionable shows the same thing you know where philip zimbardo got a bunch of graduate students took them out into the desert and made some of them um, role play prisoners and some of them role play mm. warders um, and and then sort of chronicled how they got into those roles to a terrifying extent how the, how the, the roles that they were playing dictated their um, their actions the, the 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 guards the warders becoming more and more cruel and arbitrary <clears throat> In their treatment of the um, of the prisoners, even though the whole thing was just role play, um, you know. So, if personality is situational, if it's dictated by social role, if it's dictated by the situations we find ourselves in, then there are lots and lots of different versions of us, um, which are equally sort of equally valid, equally viable, um, equally true. We, we 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 are with the result of a, a, a collection of accidents, happy or unhappy. And we could have ended up somewhere very, very different from where we actually are. So some, some, some of those ideas were sort of at the back of my mind when I was writing the book. But also I wanted to, I wanted to write a story about domestic violence and what domestic violence does to, um, to the victims of it. How that can suppress certain aspects of personality and bring others to the fore. Um, what victimhood does to you was a part of the uh, the impetus for the story as well. Yeah. And there's so much to muse upon and so many directions that I could take things from there. But, I mean, experiments like The Onlooker are so fascinating because there's so many different motivations as to what you would do. I mean, I think now as well, if you saw someone, let's say, 
shoplifting, obviously you're thinking about what is ethically the right thing to do, but I think there's an awareness that these days if somebody is shoplifting, what else could they be doing? Could they be carrying a weapon? Could your life be in danger if you kind of try and intervene? So there's all sorts of other factors to consider. Yeah. The, the, the most terrifying thing I read on this theme, although it's going to sound um, trivial, uh, have you come across the Daniel Kahneman book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow? I have, yeah. yeah. Um, have. So there's, there's, a, there's an experiment that he describes in there um, where magistrates were asked to give sentences to um, hypothetical offenders. So if somebody was, was brought up in front of you who'd committed these crimes, what sort of sentence would you give them? Um, and before they responded, they were made to roll a pair of dice and the dice were weighted. So they would either return a three or they would return an 11. And the average sentence was much, much longer for the magistrates who'd rolled an 11 than for the magistrates who'd rolled a three because that higher number was in their minds in their short-term memory, they gave higher sentences. That's how squishy and yeah. analog and unreliable human brains are. That's how easy we are to influence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a manipulation. People, you know, who are not easily manipulated, normally they lament how easily others are manipulated. And they, we tend to forget that 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 level it, it's so simple to get there you know that yeah. uh, it, it's very hard because i you know I, I'm, I'm pretty observant and uh i'm the last one to find out that i've been manipulated into something but i'm the first one to notice it in other people that there's a, and it, um, it sucks yeah it <laughs> sucks <laughs> there, was, there was an American academic, Stanley Eugene Fish. Uh, he, he said in one of his books, there is no defense against rhetoric at the moment of impact. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, can, you can reason these things out later, but at the time when the idea hits you, um, you're, you're defenseless. Right. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us. It's been an absolute pleasure and we've got so much more we could talk about that if you're up for it i'd love to do it again sometime that would be very cool pleasure with all mine guys i wonder where can our listeners connect with you um i'm not very active on social media but i am on both facebook and twitter uh, i'm more likely to have a chat with you on twitter than i am on facebook i'm sort of virtually inert on facebook now um yeah. but i'm 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 there as Michael Carey 191 on, on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be the best. Also, the, the, the Orbit webpage, I think, has uh, they, 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 they run a, a, a certain amount of social media for me as well. So you can sort of get news from their webpage about stuff I'm doing. Uh, someone like me comes out in paperback um, in May, ne next month. Sort of, uh, so, sorry mm -hmm. to. Sorry to av advertise my, uh, my words. No, so, you certainly should. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's one of the reasons you're here. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners, other than obviously by someone like me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I could recommend some good horror that I've read recently. I mean, I, 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 it fascinates me that horror can operate in so many different ways. You, know, you can get great horror like um, a lot of Far Eastern movies that are almost entirely visual. You know, it's a like sort of great jolting visual moments that make the story. There's other horror that's, uh, that's in, almost entirely conceptual and has, has almost no visual uh, element at all. Um, I've just recently um, seen a, a, a great movie, um, or a, a movie that I really enjoyed, um, called He Never Really Died which has um, Henry Rollins. Oh, as yeah. A kind of, oh yeah. yeah, I saw that last year. Fantastic yeah. movie. It's just, just wonderful. His performance is, is electrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, and I read a great book by Lerd Barron called The Croning, mm. which I think is his only full-length horror novel, which is sort of Lovecraftian horror mixed with hard-boiled noir. 
It's mm -hmm. really unique and really wonderful and utterly bleak. Mm. Yeah, he's doing the 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 hardballed noir. You know, now as a matter of fact, he's got a a, a series character uh, Isaiah Coleridge, and uh, the paperback to the first book is just uh, just releases uh, okay. called Blood Standard, and then he has uh, Black Mountain coming out. Uh, I think within the next month or so, and uh, it, it's. If you, if you if you grew up and, and I'm thinking you know because I'm I'm 52 so you you're just a, a little bit older than me but when we couldn't read horror we turned to crime yeah you know and growing up and if you if you like that kind of you know those kind of stories you know the 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 Lawrence Block the the Michael Connelly uh, then definitely you you definitely want to check this out what 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 Laird's doing with that it's fascinating. I will definitely share that out. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to our conversation with M.R. Carey. We'll be back again next time when we'll be chatting with Robert S. Wilson, the publisher of Nightscape Press, a writer and award-winning editor. It's a pretty heavy conversation at the start as we get into some quite dark early life lessons but after that we talk about the charitable chat books we talk about robert's journey as a writer and of course the origins of nightscape press so it's a conversation that i think you're all going to get an awful lot out of and it's one that i'm very proud to present to you so do keep an ear out for that next week but of course if you want to get it a little sooner then the best way to do so, or in fact I should say the only way to do so, is to become our patron over at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get to support the podcast and get early bird access to each and every episode, to submit questions to each and every interviewee, but you also get to join the This Is Horror Writers Forum on Discord. This is a thriving community where we're chatting about writing and reading. We're talking about all things horror. And we got loads of different people beta reading each other's stories. So this has taken the This Is Horror podcast Patreon to the next level. And you can be a part of it for just $1. So if you're on the edge, if you have been on the edge about supporting us... You've been waiting for something else to come along to really give you value with Patreon. This could be the thing for you. Check it out. See what you think. www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a St Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day! As always, I would like to end the episode with a quote. And often this is a writing quote that I want to inspire you. It is a tip or something that you can take away and apply to your own writing. But today I'd like to do something a little bit different. And this might be how we do things going forward. Instead of quoting a writer on writing... I would like to quote just a, a very small passage from a book or a short story that I'm either reading or have read and that has really stuck with me. So today I have a quote from Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. What makes us the most normal, said Reiko, is knowing that we're not normal. I'll see you in the next episode, but until then, take care of yourself, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, 
and have a great, great day.